If you have been gaming for as long as I have, you have likely developed quite a list of things about certain games that bother you, or you simply can't stand. It can be anything, really. The way certain titles look, sound, or play have significant effects on how we enjoy them. Heck, I know a few folks that can't stand certain genres just because of the viewpoint they're usually played from. And that is pretty much what this episode is all about. Here I am going to speak about some of the things that I have real problems with when it comes to playing certain games. They range in severity from simple things that make me roll my eyes to instances where I do not want to play the game anymore. I've got 10 things to go over, so let's get started. Something I have never enjoyed is the repetition of facing boss fights more than once. Some games employ this as a gameplay extension to fill out the content more, but it's just cheap to me. One of my favorite games of all time does this, Castlevania Bloodlines. You get to a point where you must face down the bosses you have already defeated, fighting them again with virtually no changes at all. I never found Bloodlines particularly challenging, so repeating battles I already won easily was nothing of consequence. I really feel Konami could have added some new creatures to face in this segment, an opinion that can be applied to many other 16-bit games as well. It doesn't ruin this great title by any means, but I really think it's such a cheap addition when the rest of the content is solid gold. The art of the reappearing enemy is something I have never appreciated. This practice goes all the way back to some of my favorite NES titles. This is when developers make it so the enemies reappear once the screen scrolls a little, making the bad guy you just killed pop back up and needing to be dealt with again. It can really make a game much more difficult than it should be otherwise. In fact, much of the reason why classically hard games like Ninja Gaiden and Mega Man have the reputations they do is because of this practice. I can't tell you how many times I have become frustrated by this when replaying some of these kinds of games and just shut it off. There's many out there that consider this to be part of these games' appeal, but I personally don't care for it at all. Some games even take it further by respawning enemies non-stop whether the screen moves or not. This can be equally as frustrating and piss you off as well. Tecmo's Rygar does this in a number of areas to the point where you just want to scream. Like a great many things in gaming, you do get used to it, but I'll never say it's something I enjoy seeing. When it comes to game design, I have always felt that Stage 1 should be an area that teaches you how to play and acclimate you to the control. It should not be overly difficult and should never put you in a position of seeing a continue screen. Yet some games just love to drop you into a world where you are bombarded from the moment you start moving. Sega games in the early to mid 90s did this to the point of absurdity. From the moment you take control of your sprite, something is hitting you falling on you or shooting you. Genesis games like Batman Returns were notorious for this, made all the worse by its piss poor hit detection. Most of the better games out there, even the ones that could get crazy hard, often started out with a stage that was just there to show you how to play it. The aforementioned Ninja Gaiden, even with all its respawning enemies, gave you a first stage that simply showed you how to get around and populated it with enemies that were fodder for your attacks. I extend this peeve to other genres beyond action platformers as well. Fighting games that start out crazy hard, or driving games that load you down with brutal time limits in the beginning also gets really old. 
It's something I have always admired about Nintendo games. They knew when a game should be difficult, and it was never when you began first playing it. We have all been here before, playing some game that has a story we don't care about at all, yet can't skip past it fast enough. There is some truly great software out there, I legitimately hate firing up because of an opening I have to set through to get to what I want to actually play. This type of thing got so much worse with the coming of high density media such as CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray, as every damn game maker under the sun all of a sudden became storytellers trying to impress you with their new art form. In truth, most video game stories are utterly forgettable to me, and seeing them once is more than enough. If your video game has sequences I can't skip, it makes me not want to play it very much. Are you ready? I'm going to take you through the basics. Mastering these techniques are critical to becoming a ranger. I'm Chris Parton, the leader of the Burning Rangers, and your navigator for this exercise. Chris always monitors our situation and provides us with updates. Make sure you listen to her carefully because it may save your life. One of the reasons I was not much of an RPG fan in my youth was the fact that I did not care for random battles in video games. Even when the genre became more palatable to me, I hated games that forced them on you constantly. One game that is nearly ruined by this practice is Albert Odyssey for the Sega Saturn. The early hours of this one can be daunting to even the most hardcore of RPG fans. Random battles come in a steady stream, and you'll need to do a lot of healing and measured exploration to deal with it all. I understand the notion of keeping battles a constant threat, but my god does this get tiring fast. The shame is, is that Albert Odyssey is a solid game otherwise. It's important for me to stress that random encounters in general is not a big issue, but rather the frequency and repetitive nature of them. Some games allow you some measure of control over this, but sometimes you need to put in some serious hours to get that far. Some other notable favorites that go heavy-handed on the random battles are the Fantasy Star series and Skies of Arcadia. Another thing that really stinks about some of Sega's 16-bit titles was the complete lack of a way to continue your adventure after turning the power off. Whether the game was long like Kid Chameleon, or just hard as hell like Chacon the Forever Man, having to defeat it in one setting was rather daunting to most players. Even to someone like me, returning to games like these were tough because there was no real way to keep tabs on your progress. You hit that power or reset button, and you start it from the very beginning. Many games had cheats you could employ to get deeper in them far faster, but if you wanted to see the end without them, you had to hunker down and really put forth some playtime. In a game like Kid Chameleon, there were multiple paths to consider, and seeing every stage was nothing short of impossible on your own in one setting. Thankfully, CD-based systems began to do away with this issue after a while, but for a time, some games just begged for some way to keep your adventures active. Oh man, this is a big one. 
Game companies used to have a thing where in their bid to sell you a game, they also wanted to sell you a peripheral. Many were guilty, but man did Sega piss me off with their master system with the sheer amount of gun games that had zero control pad support. Now don't get me wrong, I understand fully that using the light phaser was the best way to play, but sometimes you just didn't have the luxury. And the Sega Master System had some great gun games too. It's not like it was just some dumbass dog laughing at you while shooting ducks. There were some legitimately fantastic gun games. And to add to the pain, there were games that required multiple add-ons like Missile Defense 3D. Not only did you need the Sega Light Phaser, but you couldn't play it without the 3D glasses either. I know that companies want to get those sales in, but man did I hate running into games I could not play because of stuff like this. It's irritating even today to have to pull out all that extra hardware just to fire them up and play them for 10 or 15 minutes. Luckily, this practice did not exist much in the 16 and 32-bit eras. One of the things that I hated in gaming was the belief that digitized and pre-rendered sprites and backgrounds made everything look next generation. I never appreciated the practice and liked it even less when it was applied to a tried and true gamer series that had been doing just fine without it. This happened a few times on Sega systems to some pretty disappointing results. On the Saturn, the Lost Vikings 2 saw an upgrade to pre-rendered visuals that absolutely destroyed the beautiful sprites and stages from the 16-bit game. Even Sega themselves thought it a good idea to take all that great art from their Shinobi games and throw it away in favor of a digitized facelift for Shin Shinobi Den. I still enjoyed the game, but I honestly would have much rather have seen the Saturn flex its 2D muscle with hand-drawn assets in that one. Third parties did similar nonsense by using these techniques on tried and true designs. The new Rampage was an ugly pre-rendered mess, and even Capcom thought it a good idea to digitize Street Fighter 2. I know opinions vary on this, and I'm not saying these games were terrible, but I just never cared much for the pre-rendered and digitized looks, particularly when applied to games that never needed them in the first place. Believe it or not, once upon a time, I actually cared about achievements and trophies. It added a bit more motivation to replay the games you had already defeated, often doing things you never would have done while normally playing them. Sometimes these achievements took some serious skill to pull off, adding a bit of pride and respect to them. But then many of the titles I played began lumping in multiplayer achievements, many of them with the added stipulation of having to play in public lobbies with total strangers. This was never my thing. When I played a game with other people, I wanted it to be friends I knew really well and could talk to about anything. Dropping into a modern public match was just torture, typically filled with kids yelling obscenities and racial slurs at everyone that could hear them. A few years in, I had completely lost any desire to chase down achievements and trophies in my games. These days, I don't even have the notifications turned on to see them. In all of game design, there is no other aspect that I despise more than the escort mission. It started popping up around the same time as the Saturn and PlayStation got going, mainly a byproduct of 3D stage design. Essentially, it would put you in the unenviable position of having to keep something alive as the AI tried to destroy it. I was not a fan of these types of missions, mainly because it wasn't about taking care of yourself, and instead left you to the mercy of an AI-controlled partner. You will not find a game that does this worse than the original Dead Rising by Capcom. Saving the survivors is a huge part of the story, 
and you would have thought that a company in AI would have been created to deal with it. Nope, these dumbasses run headlong into danger, get caught on every piece of geometry in the place, and do everything in their power to get themselves killed. I love this game. It's one of my favorites of all time, really, but good lord do I hate escorting these fools. The good Samaritan in me wants to help, but that part of me that believes in the survival of the fittest wants to leave every single one of them behind. There are many more examples of awful escort missions and games, but this one right here is the perfect example of how not to do it. So there we are, some of my pet peeves in video games. The funny thing is, is that while the things on this list can have me pulling my hair out at times, many of my favorite games are guilty of them. And that's the thing, no matter how great a game may be, there will always be something that rubs you the wrong way, and you just don't like it very much. It won't ruin anything for you, but still may deserve a good thrashing in a review. No game is perfect after all, and our taste and preferences can have a big effect on how we tolerate these things. There are entries on my list here that won't bother some of you at all, and I'm sure you have some pet peeves that wouldn't bother me any. In fact, I'd love to hear some of them down in the comments. I'm Sega Lord X. thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.